from the Alistov University of Technology, Poland, and I will be remote chairman of this session. Session it is called uh, Electronic Measurements. And we have five presenters, the five presentations in the agenda. And the first presenter will be Syed Riaz Unnabi Yafri from Pakistan. And the title is Development of Low Cost Stationary Laser Screening System for Generation of Building Information Models. So, Mr. Riaz, the screen is yours. Please present uh, your presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much, sir. Okay, so my screen is visible. Yes, yes, it is. Okay, please start. Okay, thank you so much again. Uh, my name is Sayyid Riyadun Nabi. I am from NAD University, Karachi, Pakistan. And we have developed a system which you are uh, watching here, development of low cost stationary laser scanning system for generation of building information models. And I am so much thankful for, for my co-researchers and co-authors. You can see their names on this screen. So first of all, what are the objectives of this research? Actually, we would like to make a uh, low cost system in which we can use only a single 2D laser scanner. And then by making some angles on that particular 2D laser slice, we would like to uh, get its 3D real environment scanning. Second uh, task which we would like to cover with this product is to use the developed 3D point cloud map. And by using that map to make the building information model of the scanned surroundings. So. If we uh, would like to see the available products, if uh, we would like to search uh, about this thing on Google or on marketplaces. So we are having very nice products available, for example, Leica and Faro. But problem is they are so much expensive and normally uh, this is not feasible for those uh, particular contractors which are working in a low or middle scale applications. In the same uh, manner, there are some 3D laser scanners are also available, for example, SIC, MRS system and Velodyne. But problem is they are giving a limited uh, vertical view. For example, you can see for SIC, it is only 7.5 degree and for Velodyne, it is 30 degree. So if, we, if you would like to get a complete 3D environment perception, so you need to make some uh, expensive calculation by using them. In the similar manner, there are some products which are using uh, 2D laser scanners, just like you can see here in Zeb Go and Zeb Bravo RT. They are having a motorized connection with the 2D laser scanners, but again, they are having some complex LAM techniques uh, they need to run, and then they can establish the 3D point cloud map. So what is the idea? We are actually uh, establishing, we are using a single 2D laser scanner. You can see on the left uh, figure that this scanner is having 30 meter range, and it is having an angular range of 270 degrees. So you can see on right hand side that if we are placing it in some environment, so it can uh, scan that any object which is present in that vicinity of this 30 meter range. So we have placed this scanner on, on this kind of platform. You can see there are two possible motors. There are two possible angular rotations are available. First is indicating by the green, uh, arrow and second one is indicating by the blue arrow. So if the laser slice, which you are watching by the red, uh, red mark here, so it is very easy to move that red mark either on the upside or either on the downside, as you can see on the right hand side figure by just changing these two angular commands on that system. So what we are achieving if we are just moving these two different angles on this platform so we are achieving a complete spherical view which is having a 30 meter range and that can and that system can be easily uh, in a stationary condition can be easily generate the 3d point cloud so by using this concept we have started our cat modeling of the system and first as you can see that we have uh, make a simple uh, a simple box which is actually utilized to 
uh, incorporate the motors which are required and then the uh, then the certain electronics which which is needing for this particular circuitry and then we are having some cameras and some laser scanners which have been mounted and also on the right hand side which is the side view of the system you can see that uh, it is again showing the angular rotation which we can generate from some basic microcontroller for example we have used Arduino controllers for this particular operation now you can just use this system either on the table for example here you can see we are placing this system on the table and you can see that the same system you can install on some tripod and you can put this system either inside the lab or either maybe you can go and uh, use this system in outdoor vicinities so how we are going to generate the 3d point cloud of the system so actually we have utilized a, a very good concept of Danavit Hartenberg DH parameterization, which we are normally using to model the uh, kinematic of uh, simple robotic arms. So what we are doing here, we are actually uh, presenting our uh, system in two different joints. As you can see, first joint is that one, which is uh, having the first green line, which I have, uh, I have shown you in the previous slide. And it is having some angular uh, displacement of theta one. And we are assigning uh, some local reference of x0, y0, and z0. Then we are having some uh, translation here, as you can see here. And this translation is indicating the placement of our second motor, which is here representing by our second joint. And it is indicating another angular rotation of theta2. And you can see that the displacement between these two joints are indicating by some uh, parameterization, which is uh, here we are calling a1 and d1. And in the same manner from the second uh, motor joint, we are having our scanner, which is placed uh, in our vertical vertical displacement, which you can see here in A2. And we have assigned that particular local frame of that scanner in X2, Y2, and Z2. So our uh, mathematical operation is, uh, is actually uh, based on the transformation of the scan points, which are generating from the local reference frame of X to Y2 and Z2, when we need to convert this all system in the world frame to, uh, to get the complete 3D point cloud of the system. So we are using the standard transformation equations, which uh, we are using for DH parameterization. First is indicating by the equation number one, which is indicating about A1. And you can see that we are uh, having uh, some fixed rotation and some fixed translation as uh, indicated in the previous diagram and we are getting the first transformation from the uh, motor joint, first motor joint to second motor joint. Then we are having our second transformation equation by indicating by second equation. And here we are uh, again having the same uh, concept of transformations and uh, rotations. And we are having now our transformation from the second joint to the scanner where it is it has been placed. Now, by multiplying both equations one and two, we are achieving the complete transformation. And TC is indicating the complete transformation from the origin till the point where your scanner has been placed. And then we are multiplying this complete transformation TC by the individual discrete scanning point, which is deliver delivering by the scanner. As you can see, we are using Hokuyu 30 LX. It is giving us approximately 1000 scan points. So uh, you can say that equation number four, we are running 1000 times to generate our uh, complete scan point transform into world coordinate system. So for every particular angle, if you can, if you can see that from, for example, if we are generating some value for theta one and theta two, so we are repeating this step and every time we are getting a transformed scan point PT, and then we are just placing, we are just plotting this point into the world frame. Now, this is the uh, uh, simple application, if you can see here. So what we are doing, we are placing our system in one lab, indoor lab. And you can see it is now placed in a uh, tripod and all the cables and all the commands they are taking on, uh, on the backside of the table where a laptop has been connected. And you can see that if I am running the system here on this particular place, so this is indicating by, for example, placement B, for example. And this placement B is giving me uh, some scan of 3D environment, uh, which is for this particular scanner is having a 30 meter radius. Then we have taken the system on some other places, for example, placement A or placement number C. 
and we are here we are manually calculating the translational displacements of these uh, different places and for every place we are having the complete uh, 3d point cloud available and then we are going to merge this complete point cloud to actually gather the uh, overall result of this scanning operation which we have done in this indoor lab so this is the uh, point cloud which we have obtained by using this mechanism on the left hand side you can see that approximately the length of the lab in x meter you can see it is approximately around 14 meter and for the width it is approximately around 5 meter and the height is approximately 2 meter so uh, definitely you cannot clearly watch on the left hand side figure because there are so many points scan points have been plotted so we have just eliminated some planes for example we have eliminated ceiling and floor planes to just represent you that what is the what is inside available and uh, has been perceived by the scanner so you can see that there are some tables some chairs and other furniture which were available in that area so we can watch this thing and it has captured very accurately then in the second objective as i mentioned you earlier that in the second objective we would like to make uh, some building information model results because this is the actual thing which some contractors with some architects they are needing to make uh, to develop the digital twin of some already built structure so we have taken this point cloud and we have loaded this thing in a revit software and you can see that on the left hand side uh, our revit developer he actually picked that thing and he started to model some walls by watching the particular scan points and then for example for ceiling planes some pillars and some other things and then if you would like to make this model for example this is a 3d model and you just only need a 2d floor plan so you can also convert by just watching from the top side and this on the right hand side you can see this is the indication of the floor plan of this lab so indirectly you can watch that now uh, this is very helpful for architects very helpful for uh, any person who would like to renovate the building or would like to construct the replica of this building so that's why we are calling this that this is a digital digital twin of that already built structure then we have tested the same thing in another uh, corridor environment and here you can see uh, on the left hand side we have placed our system and then we have also used uh, multiple points to uh, gather the information and then we have uh, we have collected all this information to make the corridor 3d point on right hand side you can see the complete 3d point cloud map and by using this map again we have uh, used we have loaded this uh, knowledge in revit software and again the uh, development you can watch here in this particular scenario and this is the 3d view and here uh, we are having some additional uh, information which we have collected collected manually because there are some points for example some small windows they were not uh, properly visible in at this point and uh, here we are needing some manual assistance for building the complete model and on the right hand side you can see that we are having the floor plan uh, for this building so again if someone is only needing the floor plan to make some calculation so he can use this system and finally we have also tested the system in uh, one outdoor environment here you can see that we have placed this system near to the athletic track and we have placed to watch that what is uh, present in the front of this athletic track so actually there are some trees and some concrete uh, concrete you can see concrete slope was visible so we have scanned this system and on the right hand side you can watch that the developed point clouds indicating some slope some track planes and then some trees which are showing here in this particular uh, scene and then we have loaded this system again this point cloud in revit software and here uh, there are some challenges which we are facing for example trees are very near to each other so we cannot identify properly some stems which are you can see which are very near so here we have placed manually this thing and we are now still working that we can identify more dense point cloud in order to achieve more points for the tree stem and then we can uh, extract uh, particular trees from this point cloud so this is now actually we have develop the system and it is a funded project and we have now uh, given the system to our uh, contractors which were involved in this project and we are still working to uh, make it uh, more better and we are hoping that it will uh, in coming year it will be having more better results so 
this is these are the conclusions which i have uh, summarized here that we have taken all the comparisons uh, for the uh, scans which we did in different environments and we are finding very good accurate results for example approximately 98% we are getting the uh, dimensions uh, which are accurate to the ground truths and then we have compared the time which have been elapsed in all this operation so actually there are two different phases one when we are uh, gathering the information from the scanner and second when we are performing offline steps to develop this thing so it is all taken uh, very less time if we are comparing some other mechanism which are uh, still uh, working by some contractors or some uh, local market which are taking approximately five times more time uh, as compared to this system. And finally, that this is having a very low cost system and it's still it is only working with a uh, with a single 2D low cost scanner. So that's why this is also uh, feasible to use by a small vendors, a small companies or contractors. So in future, as I was telling to you that we are having plans to improve the point cloud density further. And then uh, second thing is that we are also thinking to utilize the uh, image or vision information to extract and to color the uh, point clouds which we have established from this system. So, so many thanks for listening to the talk and you are welcome to uh, inform me some suggestions or any questions, please. Thank you very much uh, for your presentation. And now it's time for questions. Uh, does anybody has question? I mean, also remote uh, users. Uh, if no questions, I have question. In the title, uh, there is a low cost. Um, could you explain uh, the cost of such system? Yes, actually, uh, this system is comprising mainly on 2D laser scanner, Hokuyu 30LX. So it is having a cost uh, within around approximately 800 to 900 uh, dollars. And if we are going to purchase some more uh, rigid, more uh, advanced version, which are as I have pointed in my initial slides, so they are costing approximately uh, 10 times, sometimes 12 times greater than the system. So this is the hurdle that we cannot uh, borrow, we cannot buy this, uh, these systems in these local markets. So that's why we have selected a cheaper 2D laser scanner. And then we have just integrated some low cost motors, some low cost controllers, which are costing approximately $200. So overall system is uh, very much economical to uh, those companies which are not having a big budget. And about this accuracy and uh, ninety-eight percent, uh, how did you estimate it? Actually, we are uh, we are having some ground truths available, which are definitely measured by some uh, some manual measurements, for example, or we have taken some CAD models, CAD drawings of those buildings where we are working. So we are comparing the developed results uh, which we have made by using those CAD drawings or some manual measurements, uh, then we are achieving this uh, figure that we are approximately, we are having 98% accuracy. Okay, thank you. Uh, maybe other questions? If no question, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you so much. And uh, yes. I didn't tell before that we have 15 minutes for each presentation and uh, two, three minutes for discussion. Uh, and we have the second presentation, power and energy consumption models for embedded application. The presenter is uh, Mr. Momčilo Krunic from Serbia. Are you present? Uh, yes. So the screen is yours and uh, Please uh, present. Yep. Yes. Uh, just let me to to woke up my camera. Yes. Yes. I hope okay. now it's it's visible. Okay. It was visible. <laughs> it was visible. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So then let me take a yeah, yeah. take a screen. Uh, just yeah, green out. yeah green green button below is. Aha! Uh -huh. Yeah! 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 Um, Thanks. Thanks for letting me know. So good luck. 
Thank you. So, uh, slide show. So today I would like to present you uh, my paper about power and energy consumption estimation models for embedded applications. Uh, just briefly to uh, represent myself, I'm assistant professor at the University of Technical Sciences in, Uv in uh, Novi Sad, Serbia, where I teach uh, students about uh, software development processes. The paper here that I will talk about is about uh, embedded software development, mostly uh, ultra low power target platforms. There is uh, this uh, uh, at, the, at the right side, uh, a, a, a picture about the target platform that we actually used for, uh, for empirical measurements here in this paper. Then this paper is also mostly about software tools development, uh, the world from which I'm coming from. And it's about, so the, the main aim of this paper and this proof of concept was uh, to develop tooling that will facilitate energy efficient software solutions. So green software development. So this paper is a follow up on mostly on these three papers present on this slide, but uh, the so the, the first we started thinking about in this direction in 2015, uh, where my colleague um, Ivan Povazhan uh, wrote a paper about profiling tool for heterogeneous multi-core systems. Uh, then I did a follow-up in this exactly conference uh, uh, in Palanga, where I uh, talked about uh, energy consumption estimation for embedded applications. So this was like a first step in towards that direction. Then I have elaborated uh, a bit more an empirical methods for power analysis of CMOS integrated circuits. Again, here in this conference uh, in 2017. And now uh, this paper represents like a more or less conclusion on this topic, on this proof of concept. So first let's identify uh, dissipation components that we find in such systems. So uh, first we have static dissipation, which comes from the leakage. And then we have the dynamic dissipation, which is much more uh, interesting. And uh, that one, is result from tra transition from one to another logic state. And as you will see further on, um, we have identified effective capacity to uh, quantify such dissipation. So effective capacity is quite neat property of the system uh, that you can use then in the model uh, to estimate your power dissipation on different uh, on different uh, frequencies, which is again quite neat because uh, you can simply estimate uh, and parameterize your your model uh, using it. So here on the picture, let me briefly explain it. Uh, you can see that uh, so the the dark gray area surface represents the static dissipation and the light gray area represents the dynamic energy consumption so uh and and this diagram here represents then uh their relation to uh frequency so if we uh if we change frequency uh as you can see on the diagram uh static dissipation just doesn't care uh, it remains the same but dynamic dissipation uh, it will uh, it uh, it remains so the surface of the light gray area is constant 
over the time. So no matter what, you can change your frequency, but the, the overall surface of the light gray area be, remains the same in opposite to the static dissipation where the level uh, remains the same, but the surface uh, uh, just multiplies. This is uh, one, one important aspect of the, of the system. So uh, one of the most interesting part of this research was measurement methodologies. And, and uh, once we came to them, came up and, and derived the model, then uh, it was a time to uh, somehow verify it. And we did it through the extensive empirical uh, measurements. So the first one uh, to discover was static dissipation. And uh, if we take into account the previous uh, property of the system that, uh, that the level of uh, static dissipation remains the same over the time, but the dynamic part, uh, uh, the, the overall dynamic power dissipation remains constant over the time, then we figure out, let's measure uh, uh, the, the, the power consumption uh, using two different frequencies. And then we will simply get two linear equations with two uh, uh, unknown variables out of which we figure out the, the static part. So this is how we uh, measure the, the static power dissipation. Then uh, much more interesting for this research was uh, dynamic power dissipation. And there uh, we can uh, define or we can uh, divide two different aspects of dynamic dissipation in terms of software development and in terms of program execution on the target platform. There is something called base cost and base cost is coming simply from the, from the, from the execution on, of one simple instruction. So one operation code. Uh, so all CMOS transistors that are involved in execution of such instruction then uh, the, the overall power needed to move the capacity from one side to another to execute this operational code is something called base cost. So every instruction have its own dedicated or related uh, base cost. This is more or less than, you know, uh, trivial in the sense that uh, this is the, the source code uh, that we uh, used for measure, for measurement of, of for example of this sub x1 p0 p0 uh, instruction which will uh, uh, subtract uh, b0 uh, from p0 and it will put no it will subtract uh, b0 from x1 and it will put the re uh, result in the p0 so anyway you can put any instruction here and then this is how we did our uh, measurements for the entire instruction set. So I just put one instruction here and, and that's it. Uh, so the base cost is then a bit, you can say trivial since uh, this is how you measure it. And also uh, what's here important to emphasize, uh, you can see here, uh, what we did here is this macro so this is the call of the macro. And as you can see here, we put repeat this instruction thousand times within this while loop body, uh, because in order to minimize the inter-instruction effect, which is the next dynamic uh, property that I will briefly explain. So we put simply a block of thousand instructions, and then we, we launch it and measure. And this is how we discover the dynamic dissipation of this particular instruction and all others as well. And the other part, which is not that trivial, is inter-instruction effect. 
So inter-instruction effect is quite interesting because it is a waste of a power that you get when you have interleaved instructions. So instructions, so uh, succeeding instructions with different op uh, operational codes. So for example, here we have interleaved NOP and store instruction. And each time we switch from one instruction to another, there will be a power dissipation other than base code, uh, base uh, cost, uh, which is overhead. So, uh, and, and this also leads to, to a one uh, interesting uh, power, uh, power efficient optimization where uh, you can then uh, drive or uh, direct your tools like compiler to wherever it is possible to put this, the instructions of the same operational code next to, to each other, because then you eliminate the inter-instruction effect. So here is, a, is a, an example uh, how we measure the, the inter-instruction effect. We interleave two instructions. We measured first one operational code for the NOP instruction operational. Uh, we measured the uh, power dissipation for the store instruction, and then the overhead that comes uh, with this uh, construction is the inter-instruction effect. And then we need to uh, we need to include this uh, effect within the models because sometimes this effect takes uh, even more than 30% of the overall power consumption in this particular target platform. Here on this slide are uh, the right estimation model for mean power dissipation and estimation model for overall energy consumption. So the here it's it's a, it's a, I mean uh, you can switch to one from one to another model. Of course, uh, power is, and and overall energy is is power that you took over the time. So it's it's of course. Uh, trivial, but it is worthwhile to emphasize because many people, uh, many people are uh, uh, misunderstood, misunderstanding uh, the the meaning of the power and energy. So, but so power is something that we take over the time. It's a mean. Uh, you can calculate the mean power dissipation, but for overall energy consumption, you need to have a time. So you need to have a number of cycles uh, that your program take for execution. And then you, you take the, the power, uh, mean power that it was uh, dissipate, dissipated over the time. And this is how you calculate the, the overall energy. So these two, I will not go into the details, but but these two uh, estimation models are the one that we derived for this research. And this, uh, these are the models that we uh, used for uh, estimation and calculation of the accuracy dur during our empirical uh, uh, measurements. And as you can see here, there is a, this uh, uh, simplified formula. Uh, so the, the power, voltage power is, is let's say one, um, uh, one parameter. And then you have static current and dynamic current. And that is all about, but to calculate these two, uh, I already explained how we calculate static dissipation and, and also a dynamic part, which is, uh, 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 which contains base costs and the inter-instruction effect, and uh, so th this is this is uh, these are the models that we that are the the focus of this research, and uh, so these models 
uh, contains uh, different uh, parameters present on this slide, like supply voltage, clock period, effective capacities that we, uh, effective capacities rep are the direct representatives of base costs and inter-instruction effects. So you have one capacity that it is being moved uh, for the base cost execution, and you have other base, uh, other uh, uh, effective capacity that is, is being moved when you switch from one instruction to another. So this is the overhead of uh, that you have, simply because one instruction uh, have one set of CMOS transistors, and the other have a different one. So the difference between those two sets are the transistors that are simply discharging or charging their capacity. And this is where this inter-instruction effect kicks in. Then a uh, number of course, of course. So in these equations, in these models, there are these sums, uh, which represents a number of cores uh, that you have in the system, in your heterogeneous system. And of course, number of clock cycles, uh, this does not, influence directly mean power, but it influences, of course, overall power consumption, which decrease uh, uh, directly with the number of clock cycle rising. And the experimental results and validation we did with the uh, real world application in embedded uh, system uh, quite often used, which is finite impulse response filter. Uh, in our system, we had two different cores, a general purpose, this DSP and uh, uh, numerical acceleration DSP. And uh, in both cases, on different clock frequencies, uh, we measured quite high accuracy levels. So above 97%, you can see measures here in the tables and also what is interesting to see and this is like a side effect of this research is how effective is to uh, design numerical accelera acceleration uh, uh, target processors so in this slide we see that uh, uh, numerical acceleration process or DSP have a slightly higher mean power dissipation than the general purpose DSP processor. But when it comes to the overall energy consumption, then you can see that the numerical acceleration processor is, is much, much uh, more efficient than the general purpose. Uh, more than four times. Uh, so this leads us to the conclusion that, of course, you, you, you should strive in direction to have a dedicated target platform for particular numerical acceleration and to, to have a dedicated uh, instruction set for that particular processor, whatever you, you can, especially in these uh, uh, target platforms that we had here in this research, which are ultra low power uh, uh, DSP platform uh, used for the hearing aids. So to conclude my presentation, so we have empirically verified our models uh, on the present uh, finite, uh, on the present uh, finite impulse response filter. Uh, application where we measured uh, estimation accuracy above 97%. Then the future work, uh, as I already uh, mentioned, uh, since this paper comes from the world of uh, software tools development. So we figure out uh, we can feed a compiler for a target platform which such, with such measurements. So it can take them into consideration during the instruction uh, set uh, uh, 
uh, uh, selection. So to take those instructions, alternative instructions that have lower base costs and also to uh, construct such execution flow where you have uh, execution blocks with the same opcode wherever possible to reduce the inter-instruction effect. And also uh, this can be uh, really uh, nicely integrated within the integration development environment to give a developer uh, uh, insight into the system of the energy footprint so that the developer can optimize peaks uh, wherever possible. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. And uh, now it's time for questions, ladies and gentlemen. Please do questions. I have one question. Please. Maybe, or maybe it's a double question. Um, did you consider uh, <clears throat> the different uh, topologies? I mean, uh, the different technologies of the MCUs and DSPs, because the lithography is uh, the the consensus is very dependent from the lithography. For example, under the ten nanometers, we have uh, huge leakages. Yep. Yep. Uh, yeah. Thanks for the question. Uh, uh, to be honest, this is a proof of concept, so we did it just on this target platform. But we uh, we have. Uh, here in the model, we have identified these different uh, contributors. So uh, the the static part is is you know uh, simply uh, th there is this static part and and it is uh, uh, alongside the dynamics. So you can have any nanometer, you know. Uh, 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 technology you 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 have, and the the you will measure uh, different uh, leakage power, and this will be one contributor to to your overall energy consumption or mean power dissipation. So, yeah, I know that while we are reducing the nanometers, we are increasing the leakage power. That's that's well known but but here in this equation i think uh, uh, we can deal with it because they are simply uh, uh, different contributors yes also with the temperature uh, with the temperature we didn't took temperature as a factor here that's true that's that's one direction to investigate, but if you have a super coolers, then you don't care, <laughs> right? Yeah, but super coolers cost a lot of money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know. <laughs> okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Time is running, so uh, I think we should uh, go to another presentation. So thank you very much, Mr. Momchilo Klunic. Thank you. And uh, another presenter will be from Bulgaria. It's Ivan Christoph, MATLAB simulink based linearization model of a bust uh, DC DC converter. Hello, do you, do you see my screen? Yes. Okay, let me introduce myself. My name is Ivan Christoph. I'm a PhD student in Technical University of Sofia. Also, I'm working in the automotive industry like a hardware engineer, and I'm designing electronic models, infotainment systems, and uh, different um, platforms uh, for um, trucks, cars, buses, and different vehicles. Uh, the presentation here, the presentation will show our paper, which is a uh, uh, top simulink based linearization model with DC disk converter.
what is the scope of the paper? The, the scope is to show the process of compiling MATLAB model of switch mode power supply with peak current mode control. After that, how it's to simplify and linearize, uh, linearize the model and then the results and compare the results with real measurements. Uh, the, to explain the, it, I, what sits behind the, this paper, just a second. Uh, if we take um, if we take one classic boost converter with uh, most common controller inside, and uh, with the different uh, with with the, the, the with this transfer function, which is very no, uh, very well known. We have several uh, interesting parts, and uh, the inter the most interesting part from it is the the one zero, which is correlated with the uh, output capacitor. Normally, the output capacitors we have um, uh, uh, they vary. Uh, there is equi equivalent series resistance vary with the temperature and uh, with the frequency. Uh, we will. We describe here the temperature, the variety of the capacitor, of electrolytic capacitor, and we can see that with the with the changing the temperature, its ESR increase a lot. And the problem with this uh, with this uh, ESR, it's it make a uh, zero at the transfer function. We can see it here. Which is moving the uh, which is moving the face, and again uh, curve of the stability diagram of the converter. And in one case, when we have a, a ESR, for example, under one ohm, we have pretty good face and gain margin. And on the other um, situation, the uh, the ESR is moving to the to the left and moving the all the whole curve of the uh, the gain upwards and decrease the face margin, which is the main uh, contributor for the switch mode power supply frequency. And to see in practice what does this mean, we have a 25 degrees. Um, Stable, uh, frequency uh, response port with uh, 50 degrees margin and we have uh, at step load condition we have very good response of the output voltage on the other side on the, on the negative temperatures we have uh, uh, ESR of the output capacitor very uh, uh, increase several times most of the times by 10 we can see that the, the, the gain is moved, also the face, and we, we have basically no any face margin and like a result, like a result, the, um, the power supply cannot regulate the, its output voltage. We have two, two circuits in our paper. Uh, the first circuit is used in our MATLAB model. It's classic boost converter with pit, pit control. And the second uh, used for the uh, second circuit used for the baseline is a very common boost uh, boost regulator from Texas Instrument AOM 5155. First, we start with creation of the model. We can see uh, this is the high level model. We, we have a pit controller here and the feedback. Inside the subsystem, we have a uh, uh, PWM generation based on uh, logical elements and mathematical representation of that current and the voltage through the um, through the output components to the power components L and C, and C. To be able to linearize the model, we need to simplify it because uh, we cannot linearize it with um, uh, 
when we have zero crossing elements like uh, flip flop and PWM pool generators. After linearizing, we set the input point of linearization and output point of linearization and use the mod uh, linear analysis tool of the boost uh, of uh, MATLAB tool. We receive operation point settings and result from the matrix uh, in the matrix of linearization of the model. Like a result, we compare the, the, the behavior of the of the three different system, nonlinear and simplified linear nonlinear system. They are basically the same. There is a slight difference here in, at the beginning with uh, when the uh, the system is starting and the linearization and the linearized system in in green. We can see we have some difference, but in the time. Uh, we have good output results. This is the frequency response diagram. Uh, we can see phase. We can see phase margin of 80 degrees for the system, which is pretty, which is pretty much above the minimum requirements. Like uh, at the end, we compared with the real measure on, on mockup device and we are using frequency response analyzer to inject uh, perturbation inside the feedback and in this and uh, we calculate and the device calculate the 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 gain on the phase margin we can see here the similar so the results are not the same because so uh, here we are analyzing uh, real device with low tolerance inside and basically we don't know what is inside the IC. Uh, but the results are comparable by, by form. So we can use it uh, for additional investigations uh, of this problem. Thank you for the attention. Thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, it's time for questions. Does anybody in Palanga has a question maybe? Or someone from remote users? Uh, Okay, so I have a question about these border plots. Uh, could you show us uh, this, this, one? Yes, this chart? Yes, yes, yes. Uh, what signal analyzer did you use uh, in your experiment? And what in, in fact is frequency band, yes? Uh, which is useful here, yes? Which is... Uh, uh, so... Um... The frequency response analyzer is uh, uh, Bude 100 from Omicron Lab, though I think it's an Austrian company. Uh -huh. And the we are the useful part is from 1k to I would say somewhere 1 megahertz. Because mm -hmm. here in this graph, the interesting thing is where the gain is zero or one, uh, the gain the gain cross zero. Mm -hmm. This means the system has a uh, unity gain. And here uh, we see the phase margin, which is uh, the, the main measurable for the stability of the system. And the second part is to when we have uh, zero degrees phase margin to see uh, zero degrees phase to see how what is the uh, the gain margin mm -hmm. and this previous uh, border chart uh, was uh, from this simulation. one yes, yes yeah this is from a simulation so uh, is it a big difference between uh, simulation and experiment uh, in the gain it's not big difference 
in the face we have difference because of the different systems mm. we, here we take only actually with uh, we have uh, i would say static mm -hmm. uh, device we don't have tolerances here taken in, taken into account but uh, we are working to to introduce also this like a uh, uh, input because the, the idea behind this model is to uh, to take into account these tolerances in the circuit and uh, in the, in this in the switch mode power supplies every i would say one nanofarad can change dr dramatically the behavior of the system Okay, thank you. Any other questions? No questions. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. And uh, it's time for fourth presentation. Uh, presenter is Bing Zhong Peng from Lithuania representing Lithuania and uh, it is quantitative anal analysis of parameters dependence of PVDF film polarization. So Mr. Bing Zhong, the screen is yours. You can hear me? Yes, yes. 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 Okay, okay, good. Okay, please start. Yeah. Uh, hello. Uh, uh, my, hello. My presentation will be research on quanti quantitative analysis of parameters dependence of PVDF film polarization. Uh, the con contents will be uh, about the introduction, methodology, analysis, and the results. Also, my conclusions. Now, I would like to touch about the introduction part with the rapid development of Internet of Things more and more ultra low power consumption electronics were created. The traditional power supply method doesn't ensure mobility for cases where power cable cannot be installed. Also, some of them don't meet the environmentally friendly requirements. Uh, the piezoelectric energy harvesting is one of the most promising alternative methods. Mm. PBDF-based energy harvest has a lot of uh, advantages. It's very flexible, lead free, and uh, high sensitivity. Also, longer device life cycles. But also, there are some disadvantages, uh, such as relatively low piezoelectricity, nano band characteristics. Because, because of these disadvantages, the performance of PVDF based energy harvest is largely limited. So, my objectives are design and build a suitable experimental setup to increase the piezoelectric coefficient to make it more efficient. Also explore a clear relationship between the PVDF polarization and the inference factors. Uh, based on my objective, first we need to decide a way to evaluate the polarization of PVDF theoretically. These two are the constitute, these two are the constitute, uh, consti constitute equations of PVDF piezoelectricity. The piezoelectric, the piezoelectric effect originates from induced polarization, which is also used for energy harvesting in that condition. There's no electric field, so we can get the equation D equals P. Uh, and the piezoelectric effect is orientation dependent. Equation expressed like this can be uh, found, the, but the on, but the only non-zero elements of this piezoelectric constant matrix are D three one, D D three three, also D five one. While we only use the three three model in energy harvesting, therefore we can get this equation P equal D three three multiply the stress sigma. Uh, for now, we can evaluate the polarization 
using parameter uh, D33, as long as we keep the stress uh, constant. Here are the con uh, two parts, polarization part and the measurement part. For this polarization part, I, I can control the voltage and because we need to apply high voltage, so we need to control this also the temperature and then the pouring time. Uh, after polarization, we need to use the uh, ultrasonic sensors to measure the result. Uh, here, here is my result. Uh, I have done many groups of experiments to test out the three types of PVDF materials. Mm. First is about, about the, the pouring voltage. Seven experimental groups on the voltage from two kilowatts to five kilowatts by step zero. Five kilowatts were carried out. The different points stand for three materials. As, you, as we can see, a linear relationship can be got. Uh, about the polling time, I also done 16 experimental groups with time varies from one minute to three hours. From this graph, we can understand in the beginning, in the beginning, the this rate increased with the polling time to about 40. Five minutes, the polarization gets saturated, and this remains a relative constant. Also, the temperature, we can get similar results with the as the, with the uh, pouring time. Here is the result of long-term behavior of this rate. Figure one and figure two shows the result of material one and two. I. I measured each material for seven days, one time per day. We can see that the piezoelectric coefficient drops on the second day, but keeps keeps in a stable position after the second day. I also compared the compared the result of first day and second day while the PVDF were pouring under different temperatures. The piezoelectric coefficient can drop about 10. 10 to 20 percent while pouring temperature no more than 90 Celsius de degrees. Pouring time temperature up to 100 uh, or more, only about Hey, Mr. Pank, we, we still don't uh, have voice. a problem probably with connection. I'm sorry for technical problems, probably with internet connection. Maybe you could stop your screen sharing. It would be better. Yes, yes. Maybe you could say some conclusions. no response Still no sound.
Mr. Bijong, maybe you could load your presentation with uh, conclusions on the screen and we could read it at least. Oh, yes, we can see. Still no sound. Okay, let's wait one minute. Oh, it's something changed. Let's wait one minute more. If it will be still problems, we will close the session. Darius, tell me uh, this man from Ecuador is still absent, yes? Yes, I just checked mm -hmm. uh, some time ago and right now again, and there is no response to, to the emails from no one. I mean, no one from co-authors uh, haven't responded until now. So I suppose that, uh, yes, the best the way is just uh, to thank to all participants and of the session and, and close the session. Yes, so uh, I'm sorry for these technical problems. It is usually when uh, we have remote sessions. Uh, and uh, uh, We had four presentations and uh, I want to thank you for your attention and I would like to wish you very good, uh, how to say, uh, stay on conference and I would like also invite you for lunch, which uh, would be in 10 minutes, yes? Hmm. So thank you very much and have a nice day. Okay, thank you, Adam. Thank you to all presenters. Gimantas <laughs> <laughs> is waving me. Yes, <laughs> hello. <laughs> I hope to see you uh, uh, next year in Palang. Thank you very much.